I'm glad to have you here tonight. Um, Tim Wu um, is one of our fellows at the New America Foundation, a, a Schwartz fellow. He's, um, I guess his day job is at uh, the law school at Columbia, but um, in the way that we do at New America, we find talent um, and invest in it and give them the opportunity to do things that they might not be able to do in their academic or journalism lives. And um, Tim's book, um, Master Switch, I hope is, is the result of some of our investment in him over the last couple of years. Um, you're probably looking up here and thinking that Ken Auletta looks a lot different than the last time. And that's because this is not Ken Auletta. Um, the, the date for this event was a little bit of a moving target um, with the dates for the book tour. And unfortunately, um, there was something lost in the translation and Ken wasn't able to be here tonight. We we're very lucky to have Jacob Weisberg um, from the Slate group with us. Um, Jacob is a long friend of the New America Foundation. Slate is an invaluable partner to us. Um, we put on something called the Future Tense Series with Slate and with um, Arizona State University, and um, we happen to share a lot of talent, Tim Wu, um, among it. So um, I'll let the two of you go. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. I was going to say, through, through a new process that reverses aging, I'm uh, <laughs> able, to, able to substitute for Ken. Um, no, I'm, I'm flattered to be in the Ken Oletta role. I would l I'll try to live up to the, the job he would do if he were here. Um, I'm here as uh, a friend of Ken's, as a fan of Tim's, as a great admirer of this book, The Master Switch, which if you haven't read it, you're in for a great treat because um, although the history of communications industry in America might not sound like a scintillating topic, Tim has found a way to make it into an incredible story or a group of stories. And uh, just to get started, um, Tim, I wanted to ask you to talk about some of these figures yes. who are really at the heart of the book. And I should say a little plug for, for my magazine. We've been excerpting the Master Switch in Slate this week. It's not an excuse for not reading the book, but we do have <laughs> the highlights of some of these um, some of these moguls who mm -hmm. Tim is. I don't know. I think Tim has started to identify with them a little <laughs> bit. So, but let's first talk about some of the some between of these the two of us. You would be you are actually the media mogul. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I read when I read about them uh, in in your book, I'm not sure that they were they were role models in some ways. But I think a smaller empire is probably more manageable. But um, but anyway, I want to talk about some of these people. Then I want to talk a, a little bit just to get us started about you know what what makes a mogul right. and what do these characters have in common, and then maybe we can kind of bring it up to the present a little bit. Sure. But I will. Continue Confess the first the first part of your book is about someone I was not familiar with, who's called Theodore Vale, who was yeah. the man who built the AT and T yeah. empire. Yeah. Why was why was Vale so crucial? Tell us a little yeah. bit of the story of Vale. Theodore Vale. Uh, first of all, thank you everyone for coming. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's just very. Um, yeah, I'm I'm loving this book tour and partly just the chance to talk about uh, these ideas I spend so much time on. It's, I, I'm so I'm very grateful for you to, for coming. Uh, Theodore Vale is a crucial character in this book, the greatest AT&T president. And the reason is that he brings out everything that we sort of love and we hate about information monopoly and about basically giant companies and the men who lead them. He is, uh, in character, uh, something like a private sector Theodore Roosevelt. So he has these very imperial visions uh, very large visions of of what AT and T should be. Uh, he breaks. In fact, at an early point in his career, he leaves AT. He leaves AT and T because he thinks they're too small. Their idea is that uh, phone service should be a luxury service. Um, you know, sort of like a private jet, something that rich people have. Uh, you know, businesses have, but not something people have. And there is a point in American history where the telephone might have stayed a luxury, extreme luxury product, like private jets have have remained. But he had this vision he said, he, that AT&T should be a nation, nationwide unified monopoly. And that, in fact, the entire sector should be monopolized and run by one company, and in particular run by him. Um, so th that sounds a little you know, imperial and maybe not attractive. But the attractive part about this man is he had a very strong sense of public duty. And so he went to the federal government, he went to the public, and he said, we see ourselves as a public utility. When, he started, when people started to question the size of the company of AT&T that he was building, he said, we volunteer to be regulated. We would like to be regulated as long as the regulations are reasonable. So can you imagine today if, if, if Google or, or Facebook or, or, or Microsoft just said, you know what, we hear you, regulate us. 
Only cigarette companies do that. Now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, regulators. And, and one of the most interesting things, this is something I start on, and I don't want to go on forever on this, is he was a businessman, but he has a very different idea of capitalism than we, we have today. His idea is that competition is bad for America. His fundamental theory is that competition brings out the worst in men and is, by its nature, wasteful. Why is that? Well, he says, why have three, five, ten companies building ten telephone wires all over America, or almost for any industry, why have all this destructive competition, people driving down prices? It just leads to waste, bad behavior, cutthroat, uh, cutthroat tactics. His vision of America was one where every industry would be run by a monopolist with a good man in charge of it. Sort of a, a titan of business would be in charge, would work with the federal government, act in the public interest, but also have total power over their industry. This was his vision of how American capitalism should be. And he wasn't the only one at the time. And it is very, it's, it's a sort of vision that's both either incredibly attractive in some ways, because it was a really powerful, extremely efficient, highly innovative company, but in other ways somewhat terrifying when you reflect that that union between state and private power isn't that different from corporatism, and at some level isn't that different from fascism. Well, that's a, that's a provocative statement. I think we have to follow that sure. up a little bit. I, un I, understand the, uh, <laughs> I understand the corporatist idea mm -hmm. that, what's, that you, what you're getting is, is, a kind of, um, mm -hmm. is a kind of merger of the, of the, of the business function. And you, aren't have, you don't have competition, and you have the government um, working hand in glove with, with the monopoly. But why is that? I think of fascism more as a form of social organization and social right. control. Right. Why do you get that through a monopoly like... Well, it's not there. It's, there is a line, but it's a, it's a step away. One of the th people, the theorists who I studied for this book was a man named Joseph Goebbels, who was a very interesting information theorist in his own way. And what the Nazis wanted to do, their whole idea uh, of what the purpose of the information sector was, was to mold the entire nation into a single unit. And they called this the, the, the super community or something. I forgot the German word. Uh, their idea was that, that, that and, and crucial to that was centralization of all the information industries. So Goebbels has this line, he said, the first thing we must do is clearly centralize all radio. And they did the same with telephone, and, and eventually television wasn't really around, but they were starting, uh, and film industry also. So th they had, they, um, my point is that the molding of a national community, which is the center of fascism, the idea that the people think as one, you know, guided by their, by their leader, was intrinsically and closely tied to the communications industries and the government having control over a centralized community industry, uh, communications industry. And we, we did a little bit of that in America. I, maybe, yeah, so I'll, I'll leave it there. I could talk about what we did in America. Yeah, well, I mean, talk right. about, talk a bit, a little bit about <laughs> the period when that was still possible. I mean, when, when, you know, or maybe you think it's still possible now, but when centralized control over communications could be used in such a way right. to control the information that mm -hmm. people had. I mean, certainly we right. think that that's something that's not imaginable in our society today. One of the, uh, what I think is one of the most radical inventions in human history is this thing called prime time. It's a radical idea that everyone in a single nation, you know, 100 million people, and in Germany, 60 million would sit down at the same time and, and, and absorb the same information. You know, because when you think before the 20th century, there was no technology to make that possible. So, you know, in the 19th century, people might eventually read the same book or something, maybe. But generally, you know, if you lived, let's say, in, in North Carolina in 1835, there was no way you would ever be, be uh, exposed to the same information as someone living in San Francisco. There was just no way at the same time. So this idea of prime time, that is, the, of people sitting, the whole nation, essentially, or a huge part of the nation, paying attention to the same information at the same time, was wholly unprecedented in human history. The Germans called it uh, uh, Nationalstunde or something, the National Hour, and they used that concept of enforced listening to, to create this unified community. And th th I, 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 I can't remember exactly what your original question was, but I think this is something that actually happened to Americans, too in a way, that we were in this uh, much more unified than we had ever been before in the 20th century, 
unified in ways that are, again, attractive in some ways. Everyone has something to talk about the water cooler, but also a little terrifying. Well, but let's talk about that a little bit. I mean, certainly the government through the FCC enforced limits on what could happen on television. Right. What kind of content, um, not just what kind of content could be broadcast, but what kind of content had to be broadcast as a right. condition of a license. Right. Right. But do you think that, that at the time, looking back at this now as, now as a uh, communications historian, crossed the line into dictating the content of the message as opposed to drawing, drawing a boundary around what was allowed? I, I don't think the FCC did that. In some ways, I wish they had a little bit more. Um, what the FCC did is it believed also in basically Vale's vision. The reason we started with Vale is because he is like the, the man whose ideas shaped everything. So he started in the telephone, but his ideas also shaped radio, the shape of radio and the shape of, of, of the television industries. And the FCC believed very much in that point, in that, in that period, in the 1930s, in, a few, in, in centralization and planning. You know, we think of that as sort of a Soviet idea, but uh, this is a very po you read all the old FCC documents, and they say the future of radio must be very planned, it should be centralized, the best radio stations should, should, um, should, should control the content. Uh, you know, it's the same that was going on in urban design, where people are saying we need to, you know, have a better organized, uh, we, we need to, I'm, I'm thinking of Moses and knocking, you know, we need to knock down Soho and run highways through New York. That everything had to kind of be planned. You had giant federal agencies in the 30s that were going to plan the economic future of America, gi giant companies like General Motors. So it was all the piece of centralized planning being very popular. So the FCC took that ideology of central planning and took it to radio. But the thing they didn't do is they put some pressure to do stuff, but they were mostly happy for it simply to be a commercial medium. Yeah. And so we ended up with a national culture in some ways where we weren't listening to Hitler or to Stalin or something, but a national culture focused on commerce and, and consumption. This stuff isn't quite in the book, some of it, but well, yeah. You but know, this you is know what, what is in the book that, that really fascinated me? Yeah. So we've talked about telephone, and the thing about radio that I thought was fascinating was what you wrote about the BBC mm -hmm. and how differently radio emerged right. and evolved in Britain, where it was much more what you were talking about in terms of a paternalistic government structure. Yeah. There was, there was very little choice, and there really was an assumption that didn't seem to be, based on what you wrote, really questioned anywhere that the, you know, the people who ran the society right. were going to decide what was good for people right. and yes. give it to them, and there wasn't going to be any alternative. Right. And not only were, we, were, they, were they going to determine what was good to, for people and give it to them, they were going to charge people for it, right. quite a lot of money. Yeah, the BBC model is another really important model in the book, and, you, and you, you've just, just described it is it was also a highly centralized model like NBC or like AT&T or all these other 20th century companies. But their idea was associated with a man named Lord Reith, who is this very highly religious figure who believes that God uh, put him on earth to run the BBC. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I was actually talking, I was talking to the BBC people earlier today. The BBC was sponsoring the TED conference where I talked and they talked about the lasting, we were talking about the lasting influence or not of, of Lord Reith. But he had a philosophy, which he said, let's not kid around. This is a centralized, powerful medium. We shall use it to bring the best of everything to the British people. It, we are going to have a monopoly, but it is going to be good. And, you know, we're not, it, and, and that was his vision. And in some ways, um, I, I think there's kind of two options. Either you have a truly competitive system, and then you take what, what happens, and that's, that's a, a fair, like a truly competitive, decentralized world. But if you are going to have monopolies, maybe you should kind of insist they be good. Uh, that's what I find attractive about the BBC model. The thing about the American model is we had monopolies, but we s pre sort of pretended they were private companies, when in fact they were s supported by the state. And so, yeah, so I, there's attractions to me in the, in the BBC model. Yeah. Well, it's sort of interesting. With, this, with, um, with phones and with radio, you have this model of uh, invention, innovation, experimentation, you have these sort of hobbyists, you know, in the right. radio, you know, kind of starting these stations and, and right. all this stuff, and that is then, then very aggressively consolidated right. by these moguls. That wasn't what happened with TV. There right. was no right. kind of amateur growth of TV, right? No, that's it right. Was, it was monopolized from the start. Well, they, no, no, they, there was, but it was destroyed. There was, um, uh, many people, when if they think, well, when did the television industry start, 
You notice there's not sort of a figure you can identify, like Alexander Bell or, or Thomas Edison with a light bulb, and, or, or, and that's usually a sign of something. It usually means there was an industry, but they didn't make it. In the case of uh, the United States, there were the man, probably the first radio uh, TV station was opened by a man named Carl Jenkins, who I'm almost certain no one in this room has heard of. He also actually invented the motion picture. So he's invented two of the most important inventions in media history, and no one has heard of him. You know, it was a mechanical television. It wasn't as good. May, more people may have heard of Farnsworth because of this uh, play, The Farnsworth Invention, uh, and, a, and a, uh, a book. So he's been a slightly, his reputation has slightly been resuscitated. But the original TV industry was a mechanical industry. The first American TV station opened in 1929. Mm. It's a very little known fact. Um, it was mechanical. It was not fancy. And the, the uh, government, what, what destroyed it was a union of the radio trust, the, the existing radio powers, and the, uh, and the federal government. Under the theory that it wasn't good enough for Americans, that the, the, it, the quality wasn't there yet. Now, I just ask you, imagine if that were the way the technological markets work today, where the government had decided the product wasn't quite good enough, so it wasn't ready for the public, and therefore couldn't be sold commercially. I mean, when cell phones first came, you know, when computers came out, they were a joke in the early, they didn't do anything. You had to write all the programs yourself. If we had sort of kept that approach, you wouldn't have had the computer revolution. If you had an approach where you had to basically get the clearance of the, ma of the incumbent industries, and it was trusted to them. But anyway, that, that's uh, going on. I, I want to pick up on one thing that I said about the BBC uh, in the early radio. There's a strange tendency in American history that I've noticed for us to pretend companies are private, when in a sense they're kind of part of government. We had these sort of quasi private companies. So the companies that started radio, NBC, mm -hmm. NBC was, a pr was actually originally founded by AT&T, which was the government sanctioned monopolist. It had a different name, NBS. It ran into some problems with patents, so they did a deal with the Radio Corporation of America, which was created by the Navy after World War I to hold America's uh, uh, radio patents. So you have two companies which are essentially state-created entities, state-sponsored entities, creating a third entity, NBC. And then we sort of pretend it's a private company, but you know, it's, this is not Adam Smith competition. <laughs> this is industrial policy in some ways gone crazy. And I just wanted, just wanted to point yeah. that out. That we, I mean, essentially, it is like, it's not that much different than the BBC. The BBC is openly and clearly a crown corporation. Uh, actually, when it starts, it's not, and I, that's a different story. But is, is more clearly uh, or, or explicit about the fact that they are not really a private company. But sometimes in America we have kind of companies which really are supported by government, but we pretend they're, they're private. No, so, but look, go on that too much. Yeah. But let me ask you about that idea. I yeah. mean, so, you know, th there's both the sort of pretext and the necessity for government intervention, intervention in these industries we've been talking about so far, which is mm -hmm. the scarce public good of the airwaves, mm -hmm. right? So you can't, it's hard for me to imagine, although maybe you've figured out how it might work, how you could, could have these industries without anarchy and without government, without it's some level of government right. distribution of the, of the resource. To, to my mind, it's called the free market. You know, there are designs of industrial, in the 1920s, I guess we're talking about radio and, and spectrum, and uh -huh. the, the idea was, well, you had to have government step in to solve the problems of interference. This is kind of the received, mm -hmm. uh, you know, some, not everyone uh, may find radio interesting, <laughs> radio history something, but th that's the received wisdom. But it just wasn't, it wasn't true. I mean, many industries which result, rely on a scarce resource nonetheless are able to start without the government choosing one or two companies to own the industry. The telephone industry could have been a more competitive decentralized industry. Mm -hmm. No, there was a choice, and people at the time thought it was better to have a monopoly. They agreed with Vail that competition was bad. They agreed that a monopoly was natural and better, and so we made that choice. Yeah, but it, there's a, there's, there is something between the AT&T natural monopoly idea and the sort of government-sponsored monopoly mm -hmm. and a milder idea of regulation such that, you know, the spectrum is divided up so that there's, mm -hmm. not, that there's not interference in the airwaves. Right, that's true. I mean, you, you can... There was some necessity for, for regulation in radio. I, yeah. I, I agree with that. But there are many different ways. I don't want to get into a whole legal discussion. But you can regulate by saying, all right, this is what you do. 
this is your spectrum and, and you're in charge. Or you can regulate by saying, if you create too many problems, uh, you will have a penalty. So, so the difference is between the railroad system and the cars. Mm -hmm. We don't, you know, s roads are a scarce resource. And you could say, well, you know, roads are scarce, so we're going to reserve these lanes for these people at this time. Or you could say, everyone drive, and if you hurt other drivers, then you get a ticket. Right, so if you create too much interference, you, you have to pay a fine or something like that. There, there's different, there's much more decentralized way of, 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 of regulating. It's, it's kind of hard to explain. It's a difference in legal theory between a, a, a common law tort-based approach and a, and a regulatory uh, command and control approach. Yeah. yeah. So I want to I want to make you talk about Steve Jobs in a minute. Before sure. we do, I want to I want to <laughs> kind of follow this discussion a little bit into the present mm -hmm. and talk about the different way that the most contemporary, the the, the newest communications mm -hmm. or media mm -hmm. um, or technology mm -hmm. uh, corporations, some of them quasi monopolies, right. emerged. Was it fundamentally different? Was the emergence mm -hmm. of Google, a fundamentally different story from the emergence of AT&T, or is it a version of the same old story? It's, it's a great question, and I think it is like th the question for our time. <laughs> you know, we live after the Internet Revolution, and one of the ideas of the Internet Revolution was that, there are many ideas, but one of them is that it would be sort of paradise as if designed by Adam Smith. We had a ferocious competition, no company is, is safe. Every company is, is and, and, we pro and we might just see a lot less monopolies, it's, it's the true free market. But in fact, um, what you have, and so there's a sense the internet was just by its nature going to be different. But as you just suggested, we look around and you have Google has a monopoly over search. Um, Apple has a more or less monopoly over, over uh, music downloads. Uh, Facebook is the, the, the by far the lead um, uh, social networking site and, and Twitter, Skype. It's a lot of markets controlled by a single firm, single dominant firm. And to answer your question, my instinct is that the methods used are exactly the same. Uh, what made AT&T's uh, monopoly powerful and effective? It's the fact that a telephone, you know, ten tele a telephone that reaches a whole country is much more valuable a product than one that reaches half the country. Similarly, Facebook, a one site to unify the whole country, or in fact the whole world, is much more valuable than ten or twenty different social networking sites. So the old economics of, of, of networks effects, as they're called by economists, are still highly uh, 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 relevant. Same with the uh, economies of scale. I can go on about this, but the same with economies of scale. Google's main advantage, what maintains a Google monopoly is its back end, its, its scale, its ability to invest in, in the servers and the computing power to keep the search like this. Um, and the, uh, the other... Finally, the leaders, while well, they're a little less, um, leaders today are not quite as open about their aspirations. People don't, it, you're not allowed to say you want to be a monopolist. It's kind of like talking about eugenics. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Vale would say a monopoly is better than, he would just be out there, all right. But I think a lot of people at Google, when you're behind the scenes, are like, it's better that we are in charge of it all. <laughs> you know, or, or uh, Steve Jobs, uh, another man, uh, pretty clear that he thinks that if he puts it all together, everything will be better. Right? You know, let, let me choose the, the, let me make a deal with Hollywood, uh, here's the way the phone works, don't try and use it a different way, and here's the best network. Basically, let, leave it to me, and I'll, I will create an information nirvana. So the same instincts are there. Humans don't change. The only question is whether the underlying protocol, the, the vision of the internet is so naturally decentralizing that maybe it will, will stave off or maybe accelerate the decline of monopolists in a different way. And one thing is different. I just realized it's a long answer. One thing is different. The federal government is not, does not have the, the taste for monopoly it once did. It doesn't have the um, instinct to go and find a monopolist and put them in charge and leave them there. I, I don't think we have that same level of federal love for monopoly that we had once. But you, you have these cycles of the assertion of monopoly and government cooperation with it, then government challenge to monopoly, mm -hmm. and then the step back from any challenge to a monopoly. Right. And are you saying that we're in a period now where we have certainly the same drive, which is probably right. part of human nature and in, in business, to monopolize industries, 
but much less of an idea coming from government that regulation is necessary or even to acknowledge that these monopolies are forming. Yeah, I guess overall, that, that, I think overall government is less active, if I'm going to compare now with, with 100 years ago. 100 years ago, government was highly active in creating monopolies and much high, more active in destroying them. It was, uh, in some ways, stirring the, yeah. the pot at all times. <laughs> it created the AT&T monopoly around the same year that it blew Standard Oil into to 11 pieces. So uh, 100 years ago, the government was in the business of making and breaking empires on a regular basis. And I think today, as you suggested, it's out of the business on both sides. It's not, uh, it's not helping to create them all. There are a couple exceptions. Spectrum. Mm -hmm. There is a little, the Spectrum auctions keep Verizon and, and, and AT&T in a fairly safe position. But other than that, you know, the, go the government did not build Facebook. But it also won't destroy Facebook at least according to current antitrust doctrine. Yeah. Now you mentioned Jobs, who's a very interesting character in light of yeah. the, the history we've been t talking about, partly because Jobs cuts a little bit against the grain uh, you've been suggesting in terms of the open systems and the mm -hmm. way um, mm -hmm. technology companies, modern um, media companies, portray themselves. And also, I would say, I don't know if you'd agree with me, he seems to have a strong instinct as a censor to actually limit content and conversation in a way that Google certainly doesn't. Right. No, that's, that, 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 that's right. Um, one thing I, I think you can learn from reading this book is that um, many of you be, may be aware of the conflict between Google and Apple right now. They Every couple of weeks they issue a different press release. I think the last thing that uh, Steve Jobs said is that Google calls us closed. We prefer the word integrated. <laughs> <laughs> Google calls itself open. We prefer the word fragmented. So he's been trying to <coughs> redefine the dialogue, Jobs, the op with the open closed to fragmented integrated. But what, what you can learn from reading the book is that battle is a replay of a battle that has happened over and over again in the information industries. And I'll just give you one example. In the 1920s, actually 1910s, there was this great struggle over the control of Paramount Pictures, which was the rising independent studio. And there was two men uh, in, in, at the center of the struggle. One of them basically was Google. He said, we need to have uh, an open, uh, an open film, uh, film network or film system. We have to have distributors separate from producers, separate from theaters. You know, we can't have these all together because then there will be censorship and all kinds of problems. Uh, and the films will be better this way. That was his vision. Uh, his rival was a man named Adolf Zuckor, uh, a tough guy from the Lower East Side. He was a boxer, you know, one of these uh, immigrants who had uh, suffered a lot. Actually, one of his contemporaries is William, was Wilhelm Fuchs, who became William Fox. Uh, and I didn't know this before I read the book, that the founder of Fox was a socialist. It's a no. fascinating little, <laughs> <laughs> the founder of our friend, uh, the, the f what became the Fox Network's 20th Century Fox was originally a childhood socialist, uh, mainly because he was put in prison as a teenager for littering in Central Park. Uh, <laughs> interesting little detail. Anyway, there was this huge <laughs> struggle of wills between these two men as to what the future of the film industry would be, and it's exactly like the Apple-Google struggle. One wanted an open industry, one wanted an integrated, closed industry. That struggle, the integrated industry won, and won so decisively that they eventually exterminated all of the in other uh, independent producers and film theaters and turned them into five or six major giant companies organized along the, lords of uh, along the lines of Ford Motors or Carnegie Steel. We now call these the Hollywood Studios. So. Uh, this, this struggle has replayed itself over and over and over again. And uh, to move yours, or, yeah. Who wins? <laughs> that I mean time, most, of the, most through history, I have to say the track record tends to support the integrators and the closers hmm. from what I've read, um, from, what I, from the history I've studied. However, the backdrop of that, of those struggles, are one in which everyone thought centralized planning was the best. And so people thought, well, of course, this is progress. There was a, a cultural norm in the country that progress meant more centralized. You know, General Motors was the vision of what, what progress looked like. Um, people looked up to the Soviet Union as having a good ideas in economic policy in the 1930s. So we're talking about a period where these ideas were ascendant. Right. Everything had to be big. 
Um, number two, uh, the federal government often took the side of the closers. Mm -hmm. So we don't know now, and we live in a very different age. Um, with the starting point for urban planning is Jane Jacobs. You know, the starting point for uh, uh, I I the internet, which is the most successful open network in history, is a starting point for innovation theory. And so we are in profoundly different times. People believe in decentralization. Um, eat local, all these ideas are very powerful. And, and, and people don't, we have much less taste for giant faceless institutions than they did in the 1930s. Which favors the open systems. That favors the open. So it's, it's a re-battle. The Google-Apple fight, which is the most interesting thing going on ideologically in our country right now. I mean, I, I don't, uh, compared to <laughs> politics, I think yeah. it's nothing. <laughs> I, I mean it. I, I don't think the political battles are interesting. I think the interesting battles that are going on are the ideology of open or closed systems Centralization versus decentralization. That really affects the way we live. Well, the Tea Party has a couple of people in Congress. It mm -hmm. might affect some things. like that. But this really affects the way we live. America is a lot different now than the 1950s. Yeah, yeah sorry. So, no, I was going to say, I, mean, the, um, uh, I don't know if you ever read, there was a, a famous essay, Umberto Eco, the author of The Name of the Rose, the mm -hmm. uh, philosopher once wrote, that said the battle between Microsoft and Apple was right. like the Protestant church and the Catholic church. Yeah. And, you know, Microsoft was like the Protestant church. You were, there were many, you know, many paths to the truth. Everybody could do their own thing. Yeah. You could, you know, you could have your own beliefs. Apple was like, and this was, this was 20 more, more years mm -hmm. ago. Apple is the Catholic church. It's only one truth. You get it from them. Right. And you, you, you're, you're with them or you're not with them. Yeah. And, um, and it was very it was more from the perspective of someone trying to print out a document, you know, what the, the experience of using these two computer systems. Google has clearly replaced Microsoft right. in this scenario. Right. But you do have, I mean, c c analogizing it to religion is not so crazy. I think. No, not at all. Because it is, it is, it does express a fundamental approach to the world. And I, I find, you know, as someone who both watches this and participates in this, that um, ideologically, I'm of course believe in the Google model, right. but as a consumer, I'm right. very drawn to the Apple model. And, yes. You know, part of it is that Steve Jobs, I would say, you know, rejects the messiness and disorder of the internet, sort of a, a lot of what makes the internet work, right. but he, you know, he creates these beautiful environments, right. but they are controlled environments. Yes, that's right. And, and this book, I think, m maybe not on every page, but on many pages, reflect my own the same contradiction that, that, you, that you have, the mm -hmm. same problem of, uh, two problems really. One, Apple closed and controlling, but I love their products. <laughs> um, two, Google open, uh, open and, and um, uh, in some ways uh, empowering of multiple voices and, and uh, a way of getting information that's much more decentralized. Also a monopoly. So there, there's this. Uh, th that's why I start. We go back to Theodore Vail. We, I think we have that. S you know, I think we all think a monopoly is bad, but I think we actually kind of love monopolies more than we like to admit, or at least Americans do, um, when they are good. <laughs> but the problem is, in the long term, we create them by our own actions. I mean, how do we create the? Go it, we we created it ourselves. There's no one to blame for the Google monopoly but the people in this room, and the other hundred million people outside this room or five billion, who every time they did the search, just, well, yeah, it's a little easier to go Google. Let's do that. I, have you ever tried doing a different search engine for a week? It's actually quite hard. <laughs> 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 it's actually harder than, than you think. And that, that there's, a con there's a paradox in either the American soul or the human soul in this, or a contradiction between a, a taste for and an aspiration towards openness, uh, local systems, decentralized uh, ideas, Adam Smith style competition, uh, and ultimately at the deepest level freedom is, is what uh, open systems are about because um, a real freedom, practical freedom where your you are your choices are uninhibited and on the other hand wanting things to be like you said reliable and, uh, and, and, and a better quality and above all the most powerful thing in American life, convenience. <laughs> in the country that invented automatic transmission Convenience has a, such an unbelievable power in creating monopolies uh, that I think we just have to acknowledge it. 
So yeah, I, I, that's not an answer, but it shows what what the tension is. All right, this uh, this conversation is an open system. It's Google type, so <laughs> we're gonna we're uh, I'm, I'd like to I'll, I'll Google isn't even question, that open, but right. I do I want to ask you one more thing about Google. There's more open than well, Google. Well, it sort of yeah. goes to this right. question, but it but it yes, it's open in certain ways. No, yeah. but Google does uh, claim to be a different kind of company, a different kind of yeah. giant company that we've seen in that it places a high value on ethics uh, on morality but not just on on ethics as complying with the law right on doing the right thing yes and you know there have there are a number of episodes now which the the challenge to china i think is is, is by far the most important where it is doing what you don't ordinarily see co corporations do which is make an make an ethical decision that that interferes with with profitability long-term return. Although there are some people who take a cynical view of it who think that's not what they're doing. Yeah. What's your view of Google? I mean, are they different? Yeah. Are they are they are they better people than other companies, <laughs> you know, and yeah. are they really doing things that are maybe not in their profit maximizing interest? Yeah, uh, I spent some time at Google um, at one point in my career and I, I did so because I was interested in the question which is can a company be good? I was just interested in this. I mean, this is the most important I institution in American life, the corporation, essentially. It's the most powerful, the most important. Most of Americans work for some kind of company. Um, can, it, can it be good? Uh, can it be a good place to work, or can it, can it, can it uh, do good? And I, it's I, definitely a good I, place I, to work. I <laughs> <laughs> and I, I guess I'm profoundly, I, I wish I could have a, like, a clear answer, but I think I'm profoundly divided over the question. And it, it goes back, I keep repeating this, but it goes back to this, our, our relationship with AT&T. Google is in a very similar position to where we were with AT&T in the early 20th century. AT&T said to America, they didn't say we don't do no evil, but they said um, we are a public utility, we understand deeply our duties to the American people. Profit is not as important to us as service. And so we gave them the monopoly, and at first everything was great. And they did, in fact, build a national phone network, invest heavily in research, design those beautiful black phones. But after a while, anyone in power, no matter who you are, an incumbent congressman, African dictator, or a corporate monopolist, becomes interested in staying in power. And every single company I studied eventually turns its energies to trying to destroy the threats to its power. Whether it's suppressing new technologies, most explicitly, buying up companies and kind of quietly making them go away, or transmuting them into something else. And so when we put our faith in these monopolists, we have to be constantly aware of the danger that they will become our own entrenched dictators and we'll never get rid of them. So that, that's the trade-off. That was very well put. Um, who has a question for Tim? Um, start here and work my way up. Yes. Yes, well, but the monopolies like AT&T at the beginning were very, very good right. and very inexpensive mm -hmm. and served the entire country very well. Right. However, what happens with monopolies is they get sloppy and that's where their downfall comes in. They don't pay attention to their business. And that's when the public starts to see it. And that's when they start to fail, I believe. It's, it's They're sloppy right. in the way they run their businesses. They get so secure that they're not paying attention. Or they're not advancing their business by inventing new things or looking for right. new things in the correct way. I couldn't agree right. more. I think that the will to innovate becomes replaced by the will to power. Yeah. And that it just, um, and you know, it might not, it may take 10, 20 years, but by 20 years into it, uh, there's a theory maybe that we should, and I, I advance it with some hesitation. It's a theory that we need term limits for monopolists. I mean, not like a, some kind of strict thing, but some, one thing you have with presidents is, you know, they pre you have eight years because, well, even if they're really great, you know, probably after, if you le let them be in charge forever, things are going to start to go south. And maybe we need to think about that with the other great pow private powers in our, in our, th at some point, you know, maybe 30 years, that's kind of enough. Because they do, like you said, they start to get sloppy. 
or abusive and paranoid. <laughs> I'll give you one example. AT&T uh, suppressed tape recorders in the 1930s. And the reason why is, to me, incredibly fascinating. I, I, re I read their memo when they said, uh, you know, it's promising technologies. But um, if the tape recorder becomes a popular technology, people will stop using the telephone. So they had invented the best tape recorder in the world. <laughs> <laughs> and tape recorders eventually became everything, you know, hard drives, all the, all the entire computer economy depends yeah. on, our modern economy depends on tape recording, magnetic recording information. They suppressed it, uh, buried the project, it was only to uncover in the 90s that they'd invented this. And they said people will start to stop to use the telephone for two reasons. Reason number one, businessmen will think there's a, there's a, a alternative uh, businessmen will, will be afraid because they'll use the tape recorder to contradict the, the contract they signed. So someone will bring out a tape. So no one will use the phone for business. That's the business <laughs> side. The other side, on personal, they said, we estimate that possibly as much as two-thirds of phone conversations are obscene or indecent. <laughs> <laughs> and if there's a possibility a tape recorder is being used, people will stop using the telephone. Fortunately, it didn't stop Bill Clinton from using it. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, but when he was, was taped, say, he got was, taped. Uh, he was taped, in fact. So was there was some merit. Them, but yeah. there was a paranoia in this idea. Uh, you know, this paranoia that it was very reminiscent of, like, of, a, of an Africa, of a, any dictator who's been in power for so long that they start to think anything new could be a threat to them. Yeah. And you only find out 60 years later. So there's a lot of questions. I don't yeah. want to. <laughs> yeah. 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 I was going to say that, you know, so far you've been descriptive. And is there any part of the book that is prescriptive? And you just mentioned the term limits. Yes. Um, do you have any other? Oh, I, I do. And thanks for the yeah. setup. <laughs> 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 Thank you also for taping uh, yeah. this. Uh, the, uh, what I talk about at the end of the book, and it's, it's hard. I, I ask, uh, you know, if you buy the book, to, to, it's, it's harder, it's easier to read this than to uh, explain it because it's a complicated idea. But I think <coughs> America is a country where a lot of our power is private. I think it's unusual among the great nations of history to have a large amount of the power in private hands, which is, you know, it's, it's part of what makes the country special. Um, I think for an information economy, there are certain principles, certain separations that could be extremely important to avoid some of the worst abuses that I saw in, in history. And what I talk about particularly is something which I call the separations principle. And it's modeled on the separation between church and state, or the separation between news and editorial. Th there are certain separations that are, that are rather important. And what I suggest is that we should be careful, and so, to some degree the FCC has already has rules like this, but be careful about too much combination between the companies that move stuff and the companies that create content. That is, carriage of information and creation of content, when they become united into a single company, that's often historically where the worst problems become, and in particular political problems in particular efforts to influence politics, have always stemmed from excessive vertical integration between carriage level and, tra and, tra and, and content creation. I could, go, I could tell the story about Western Union, but there's a lot, of, yeah. a lot of questions. So the separation principle is the normative part of the book, and it's at the very end. Yeah. Um, uh, here? Yes, sir. sir. Yes. I hope this isn't too esoteric, but I'm just I, I'm interested in your thoughts of on, on online privacy. Mm -hmm. And as it relates to government complicity in monopolies or what you were talking about. And the reason I ask is because one could argue that government policies right now about online privacy right. could be helping some of the monopolies that um, you spoke about, Google, Facebook, etc. Because there are laws, right. or lack thereof, hmm. about the regulation of online privacy. Right. And a lot of Google's model, monetization model, and Facebook's mon monetization model exploits that. Yes. So do, do you That's a very that interesting that? idea. You know, it's, it's um, something I hadn't thought about that, that deeply. Uh, privacy, which shows in my book, up in the book, uh, a few places. Um, I was talking about Western Union. I'll get, I'll get right back to it. Western Union in the, the 19th century had the only long distance, the only way of moving information around the country instantaneously only way. So it doesn't matter. You want to 
And um, one of the things they did is they, they liked the Republican Party. So they would just take the Democratic telegrams, turn them over. <laughs> 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 you know, they, they wanted them to win. So they, they gave them their, oh, so, and they'd find out, oh, you know, we, uh, we're planning this thing here. So anyway, whatever. That was, so that was the first, I just want to say, that's where the whole origin of online privacy, I guess, if online means on the telegraph line. Yeah. It all began in, in basically the 1860s, and there's lessons there. Um, your, your more specific question, I haven't thought ab about whether regulation of privacy creates monopoly or doesn't create monopoly. It's a very interesting question. Uh, I do know it's one of the reasons that um, there are that excessive monopolization has its dangers. Facebook probably has more information about Americans than the IRS at this point, uh, overall. And <laughs> uh, part of what may, and I don't blame them, it's their business model. We, we all, we handed it over, you know, voluntarily. Um, but uh, part of what makes that possibly dangerous is the concentration. If there were a thousand Facebooks, then there it wouldn't, if it was a very fragmented industry, you wouldn't have the kind of privacy problems. So there's definitely a link between concentration and privacy problems, because when you have huge accumulated databases of information, you have privacy problems. The other big privacy hole in our world right now is everyone's search results. Probably, maybe, I mean, I invite you to think about the things you've searched for in the last year and imagine them linked to your name over the last couple of years, every single thing. There's probably something embarrassing in there. And that's all, basically Google has all that somewhere. And they claim to destroy it, though, don't they? They claim to purge it uh, after some relatively short period of time. Yeah, and computer science, there's a paper I just read saying it's impossible to purge the data. You can always r unidentify the data. Unless you completely purge it, make it valueless. So anyway, there's, a, there's yeah. an interesting debate about that because there's a purging data, unless you make it completely valueless, they don't delete the data. They just purge right. the identifying information. Yeah. Right. There's a lot um, of questions here. Yes, sir. There's always a great deal of these anomalies tend to discourage innovation, as you pointed out, with the data. Yeah. But also, without competition, you don't get economies of scale. Yeah. You don't get increases in efficiency, which bring the costs down. Right. And when we see an Exxon Mobil making $37 billion of quarter in profits, when we see the fights that we just saw between those Fox Studios and Cablevision, Cable Vision, where they aggregate all the separate channels right. and force you to buy it through one tube right. that they only they channel. Isn't that a concern that if that continues as we get through the next stage of broadband, that it's really going to become a big problem? My answer is yes. In some ways, why I wrote the book. I think generally Americans are extremely sensitive to political concentration, uh, to public concentrations of power, but a little less sensitive to private. You know, we have separations of power, we have elections, we have federalism, we have Congress, the courts, we have all these checks and balances. Um, and therefore, you know, the, the public country, we haven't, other than maybe Abraham Lincoln, we haven't had this great kind of tyrant come to power in America, or at least not one that didn't go away in a couple of years. But the private sector, we're much more tolerant. But it creeps up on us. Yeah. Yep. But isn't there competition there? I mean, you don't have to get your cable. television through the cable company. You can get it through satellite. You can get it through your computer. Most of the people I talk to, the uh, Wall Street, people, many of the analysts I talk to, think it think it's probably headed to one one <coughs> buyer to the house. But they don't think, other than the places served by Verizon FiOS, the satellite. You know, these guys. They're basically the cable people are probably going to put together. If the trends continue, it'll probably be cable. That that uh, will be the wire to the home as a monopoly. A natural monopoly. Yeah. So that that's the direction. 
And it's a hard thing to do. What do you do about that? If that's the direction things are headed, you know, if we're headed, if there's some naturalness to monopoly, you, do you aggressively get involved and, and have the government break things up again? Do you say, well, do you, or do you ask them to be good? This is a real struggle in our in our country. And I, I guess the point of the book is to to direct our uh, our interest to these because I, I think they're the issues of our times. There's a question about that. Um, didn't the FCC? actually try to regulate ex exactly what the gentleman's at, talking about, which is they said you should be able to buy stations a la carte on cable, yes. and you, yeah. shouldn't, you shouldn't be forced to buy this big bundle of things you don't uh -huh. want. And there was a kind of positive reaction to it, and then it didn't happen. I mean, the, the idea was somehow just you know, completely you defeated. You know where that idea came from, actually? It was the Nixon administration. Huh. The Nixon administration was, it, it, you know, in some ways, uh, a bunch of radical Brandisians in this book believed in destroying the power of centralized media companies, maybe because they chase Nixon around all the time. <laughs> but they, they let cable. The Nixon administration is a child of... The, sorry, cable is a child of the Nixon administration. Ted Turner is sort of a child of Richard Nixon. He, 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 his emperor, his business, came out of Richard Nixon's decisions. Um, or, so I guess, the, the more, more either Nixon himself or the, the Cabinet Committee on, on Cable Television... The Nixon administration also began the AT&T breakup. Right. So I, maybe I'm getting slightly drifting away. But yes, the Nixon administration had that idea of having cable being completely a la carte. First of all, a la carte, but also being what they call the separations principle. They said the cable companies can carry information, but they should never create or choose what the information is. That should be done by a different company. But then Nixon got impeached and Ford came in and it faded. Yeah. So do we have yeah. uh, one more question before we have a drink, or two? We'll do so we'll you. Yes. Question. Sure. Uh, the sovereign states going bankrupt. Yeah. Do you think the ultimate monopoly of national nation nation states will collapse and we'll have a new form of creation which will be private? I don't know. I think that question's a little outside my jurisdiction. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I have taught international law in, in, in other times. You know, I don't think so. I think, or, or then it would just become public. I'm, I hold with Hobbes that there's something about the monopoly on force that uh, has a special quality and that something will arise that prevents people from killing each other and that it's hard to replicate that with or with private sources or if it is private then they're just a government right I mean there are, we have had governments run nation states like Firestone running Liberia for a while uh, or the East India Company running India so it, it is, it is, it is. Maybe, maybe, maybe that's what your point is. Maybe we'll see uh, an era, I don't know, but it's a little beyond my jurisdiction. Yeah. yeah. Let's see. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, I guess my question is, uh, to what extent do you think the internet uh, affects monopoly turnover? I mean, yes, it's a great question. On one hand, you have you know, uh, the most distributed open systems in the world that right. allow creative destruction. I mean, think about how quickly Facebook has come to power. Yes. Uh, at the same time, unlike Standard Oil, which was a geographically located monopoly, which could be regulated by one country, Facebook is now super national. Yeah. So on the one hand, you have the ability to start a company, break up big monopolies, but right. you have much wider net. This is like the question. This is the question. Facebook, Google, Apple, you know, Amazon, the monopolists on the internet, the, the rising powers in information. Is there something fundamentally different about our times? That we don't have to worry about them so much because in five or ten years they will be displaced by the gales of creative destruction. That's an article of faith among many people. Some people many people I talk to in D.C. believe that so powerfully that any evidence that contradicts it, they, they immediately shove to a side. They just believe it as religion. Um, I just don't think we know. I do not think we know. Uh, you know, I, I, all I know is history and the Internet's been around as a mass popular medium for about 15 years. <coughs> and most of the things, I, it took about 25 years, typically, for the industry to become c completely consolidated since from its popularization for the other industries. So we, we'll know over the next 10 years whether things are profoundly different. And I don't want to say we're also, there's, when we say we, we also have some power over this. You know, we can say, or we can try and encourage a, a world where th there is more turnover, um, by preventing, for example, the government freezing things in place, or even ourselves being more switchy. That's great. Well, I told you the history of the telecommunications policy was interesting, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> at least Tim makes it really interesting. I call it the master and switch, which <laughs> makes it sound more, more and, interesting. Uh,
I want to I want to thank Tim for for joining us and uh, invite everyone to uh, buy a book and uh, and have a glass of wine outside. Good. Thank, thank you. you. Thank 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 you. Th